So I've read a bunch of the most commonly recommended science and science adjacent books over the years and some of these are really good. But there's a small handful of books that gave me a more sort of meta level understanding of how some really fundamental science, engineering and maths concepts work and so I wish I'd read them quite a bit sooner. So in this video we're going to talk about what those books are, what I think are the most important things anyone can take away from them and what I personally got out of reading them. And we're going to start with The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. So fundamentally this is a really optimistic book. There's a bit early on in it that says it is inevitable that we face problems but no particular problem is inevitable. We survive and thrive by solving each problem as it comes up. And so it starts with this explanation of how science kind of emerged during the Enlightenment and how that set up the conditions for knowledge creation that we now kind of rely on as we push forward into all these different branches of knowledge. But then it gets into all these other areas of science from the theory of evolution to Turing tests up to quantum computing and ideas about the multiverse. But what ties it all together is Deutsch's suggestion that knowledge and progress and explanation are essentially unbounded. They can always be refined and improved on. And there are a bunch of different meanings for the title of the book, The Beginning of Infinity. But the unifying one is that there's no final destination where discovery stops and every new breakthrough is just the beginning of another infinite journey. Deutsch doesn't really subscribe to this idea that some scientists have, which is that in the same way that dogs and monkeys simply can't understand like how the internet works, there are some things that are simply beyond our ability to comprehend as humans. He thinks that if everything obeys the laws of physics, which as far as we know it does, then we should be able to work basically everything out. His suggestion is that since we can continually expand our knowledge and improve our ability to understand things, eventually we can understand anything that's understandable. So I think that's a really optimistic message for humanity, but it's also kind of an optimistic message for us on an individual level. Because I think it's always really helpful to remember that there really is no final destination. As individuals, we can always improve and learn, even if it's for no other reason than the sheer joy of learning. Book number two is Structures, or Why Things Don't Fall Down. And as the title suggests, this is basically a super accessible introduction to like material science and structural engineering. So it explains all the principles behind why certain structures are strong and other ones are weak, or why some materials are good for some things but not others, and it does it all in a really accessible way, pulling in examples from like nature and history and human engineering. So for instance, if you've ever wondered what a flying buttress is on a church, or why certain bows were more successful in certain types of medieval warfare than others, then this is very much the book for you. It'll teach you about efficiency in design and how nature often provides inspiration for efficient designs like honeycombs and shells and spider webs. If you want to understand concepts like compression and shear and bending, or you feel like you used to know about them and you want to get back into this stuff a little bit, it's great. But also, if all you want to do is read a fun book and learn a bunch of interesting facts that you can share with people who enjoy interesting facts, and this is still a great book for that. Next up is The Origin of Species, which is one of those books that I never really felt like I needed to read because I assumed that everything in it had been kind of expanded and improved on and explained better elsewhere since. I read a bunch of books like The Selfish Gene and Matt Ridley's The Red Queen in my 20s, and I was like, yeah, I think I get evolution now. I don't really need to go back to Darwin to understand it. But recently, after reading about this one in William Zinser's Writing to Learn, I decided to go back to it, and I'm really glad that I did. First of all, Darwin's got this really super readable style, and the book's really full of all these little vignettes about his own studies, whether he's dissecting lizards in the Galapagos Islands or examining bird poo in his back garden. And all these detailed observations of nature, particularly from his travels on the HMS Beagle, really showcase the power of careful systematic study. Secondly though, this book's really just a masterclass in how to lay out an argument. So Darwin makes the case for evolution really systematically, considering all the arguments that have come before him and breaking the evidence and theory down in a way that basically anyone can understand. And so even though it's quite long and some of the ideas in it have been improved on since, I would really recommend this as like partly an adventure story that's fun to read and partly an education in scientific thinking. And another book that I'd really recommend on scientific thinking and problem solving is How to Solve It by George Pollier. 
So this is kind of regarded as one of the classic guides to problem solving in mathematics. And even if you haven't really seriously been looking at mathematics since you were like 18, like I have, it's still like a fascinating read and it's just digestible enough if you're not really that into maths. So in it, Polya lays out this four step sequence to solving any problem, which is that you first understand the problem, you identify what's being asked, you define the unknowns, data and conditions, you restate the problem in simpler terms if you can, and maybe you draw diagrams or introduce notation to like clarify the relationships in the problem. Secondly, you devise a plan. So you think of possible strategies like breaking the problem into different parts, working backwards, using analogies or solving a simpler problem first. Next, you carry out the plan. So you execute the steps carefully and logically. And then finally, you look back, at which point you review and extend. So you check the solution, you review the method, and then you consider whether you can generalize the result or find alternative ways to solve the problem. So what makes this book really worthwhile is that Polya illustrates all of this with a bunch of examples that he kind of walks you through while repeating the main lessons from the book again and again and again. But what is even more worth reading is that this isn't a book that's just useful for solving maths problems. Because Polya's system of making sure that you understand problems and that you have the correct terminology for them and then breaking them down into smaller, more solvable problems or making them analogous to problems that you've solved before is one that you can use pretty much anywhere. And it's one that I kind of use now, but it's actually one that I could have really benefited from knowing about about 20 years ago. And so I wish I'd read this book back then. And then the final book that I wish I'd read earlier is Thinking Physics by Lewis Carroll Epstein. And so this is loads of little problems that are designed for you to work through yourself. And they might range from whether flies in a jar affect the weight of the jar if it's put on a scale, to whether a toaster will blow a fuse if it has a light bulb plugged into it. They're all designed to help you see how physics applies to everyday life and to kind of understand concepts like motion and energy and forces. And so the goal of this book isn't to teach you physics, but to teach you to think like a physicist. It's kind of deliberately non-technical and it doesn't have any really complicated equations in it, but it builds your problem solving skills and helps you to apply concepts in creative ways. There's actually a bit right at the start of the book where Epstein says, the best way to use this book is not to simply read it or study it, but to read a question and stop. Why torture yourself thinking? Why jog? Why do push-ups? If you're given a hammer at the age of three, you might think to yourself, okay, nice. But if you're given a hard rock at the age of three, and then at age four you're given a hammer, you think to yourself, what a marvellous invention. You can't appreciate the solution until you first appreciate the problem. And I think that's applicable to a bunch of stuff in life, and so I think this book is fantastic. So that's the science books I wish I'd read earlier, but if you'd like to know more about the books I wish I'd read earlier in general, to learn about everything else, including books themselves, you can find that right here. Thanks for watching.